stains with me. My guitar has suddenly died.
Good night. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to church, your Wednesday night service. If y'all would swiftly stand to your feet, we'll begin worship. It's good to see y'all. Anybody ready to worship tonight? Father, we just focus on you tonight, Lord. We put all our thoughts, all our worries, all our cares, and we lay them at your feet. We give you all the praise, the glory, the honor to your name. You are magnificent and wonderful and holy and righteous. So God, I pray that as we worship tonight, God, that you would fill this place, fill our hearts, encourage us, speak to those that need it. Let us pour out our love to you.
testimony that lines up with that. Come on. You take what the enemy meant for me and you turn it for good. Oh, turn it for good. You took me, Lord. great tonight, amen. Father, we love you, we praise you. It's you is so good. Oh. Sing that one more time, it's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you. Your
you, Jesus. Can you think of something right now that you are grateful for? All right, just pour it out, praise. Pour it out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord. God, it's we pray tonight. We pray for Ron. Ron and Andy, we pray for Ron's son. The, the twins, Lord, and they're taking the baby tonight because of the situations. And come on, church, just we just hold Ron and his family up to you. We hold them up to you, God. That in the midst of this, the overwhelming presence of God will come. Speak peace, speak hope, speak rest into their lives. And Jesus, let them just continue to look to you. Look to you, Lord, look to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We pray. Lord, there are others tonight that need your healing power. Just send that healing power power into their bodies. Come on, church. Can we pray that? Someone you know just need a healing touch in Jesus' name and for the glory of God. Let there be a release, Lord. Let, let there be a release. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. And God's people shout, amen, amen. Let's sing that one more time if you would. Just let the breath, let the breath. Come on. Sing it out. It's your breath. Your breath. Give him a shout if you would. Praise the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Turn around, look at someone. You can wave at him. You can high five. You can shake. You can do whatever. Just let him know. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Bless you. Continue to pray that Ron and Andy and the situation there. Tennessee, just a God will be with them. God will be with them. Uh, our offering tonight, don't forget it's on Wednesday nights, we still place it at the door. Uh, and you can just go by there and you can put in whatever there the Lord lays on your heart, 2,000, 3,000. I'm just doing it. But just God bless you. You know I mean that in a good way. You, can you share a praise if you can come up so that they can hear you? You can share a praise, Kimberly. <laughs> you must be excited. So you all probably know the story of my husband, um, where God blessed us with the miracle on April 11th, where he had a, basically the back of his aorta tore, and he should have died instantly. I should have found him in the bedroom, dead, excuse me, bathroom, but God chose to give us another miracle, and um, a blood clot saved him. The doctors can't explain. They can say what happened, but they can't say medically why. It defies all medicine. But we give God the glory. We give God the glory. So that was April 12th. I started realizing we really have three miracles. Six days later, he has a stroke in the hospital that they feel was caused because of that. Just in his head and his eyes. But there's been no lifelong repercussions with that. All that's checked out fine. Our third miracle, I guess I can say, is he graduated his cardio rehab yesterday. So it's just... I mean, as we're singing about breath in our lungs, and I had talked to Pastor Alec about this at one point. When you're talking about heart and you're talking about breath, it's a whole nother meaning to us now. Yeah. Whole nother. Yeah. You know, because what he struggled with that night was catching his breath. I mean, his chest was full of blood. And when I found him, he was passed out unconscious with his eyes rolled back in his head and blue. That's how I found him after he called my name. 
And so when he talks about catching his breath, and as we're sitting here just singing, I'm just like, your breath, Lord, your breath, Lord, your breath, Lord. You know, I just, and everything that doctors are telling us, it's a full recovery. There's no restrictions. And that has really just, yeah, that's right my world. Y'all can tell me, whoo, I, I can be here all night, so I'm going to try to just be quick. <laughs> but, you know, I started thinking, he's full recovery. There's nothing. I mean, there, there's He's back on his motorcycle, y'all. That's all he cared about. Can he get back on that bike? And he is. And so just to watch him with all he's been through and the Lord blessing us with that and then um, a full recovery, but how we have been able to just speak into people's lives. Um, If y'all don't already know, we serve first responders through critical incidences. That's our calling. That's what we do. We form our law enforcement. We're sitting there with him trying to figure out what's going on, and we're just ministering to first responders, to our nurses, to our EMTs in the middle of that. And um, one EMT actually gave us her cell phone, and she just has become like a daughter to us. And we stay in touch with her, and we FaceTimed her the other night so she could actually see him again. And we just all cried at how great he looks. And so um, I just praise the Lord. So just thank you again for this church, for praying. Um, this pastor got my call at midnight and was with me all night, and I just said, Pastor, I need, to, I need the prayers going up, and I know all of you prayed for us, and so thank you, because I truly know what it means to be carried in prayer. I, I truly understand that, and so again, I just thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the music, just everything, um, and again, I just give God the praise. I mean, I just, amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. You'll see Pat. Pat's usually here walking the hall somewhere, part of our security team. I'm not supposed to tell who that is. But anyway, he's got a praise report. Amen. Amen. God is good. Please, please. Let me run over these. Women's Ministry Cookout. If you have not signed up, you better sign up. It's Friday night, right? 630 Student Center. Men, you can come with your wife. You can come if you don't. You can come. All right. But anyway. We need you to be here. Ladies, men, come on out. Share the fellowship together, if you would. Super Saturday in Clover, that's coming up. It's an event we want to do with our church that's in Clover, our family there, and help them out on some kids' ministries. And I was looking here, and it said Sunday school teachers and subs. That's not a sub sandwich. That's some people <laughs> to help work. I glanced down, I thought, sub sandwiches? They're going to have sub sandwiches. No! We need subs. We need some help with our Sunday school teachers and devotionals. Without fail, almost always, when we run out of devotionals, somebody will show up a week later and say, I need one of those devotionals. They're at the Welcome Center. You better go by before they're all gone. It starts in September, okay? How many of you said amen? Amen. You get your devotional. Praise the Lord. Now, someone had said to me tonight, and Miss Tina said, I don't know who's teaching tonight, but they better be good to keep me awake. Is that right? (laughs) And I said, well, it's her husband who's teaching. So, Pastor Billy, God bless you, brother. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> They're keeping an eye on you, babe. They're keeping an eye on you. Kimberly, uh, Tommy, would you give her this mic back again? Really quick, would you give the extra testimony about Pat's brother? Okay? Because of all of this, it happened. I, need, yep. I probably need to come yep. back up come here. Come back. Yeah, so because of this situation, um, Pat's dad actually had an aorta aneurysm in his uh, gut area. That's the wrong word. And, and so there's been no histories in the family. Well, with that, his brother said, I want to go and have a specific test to see what's going on with the aorta, which is, uh, was a CT scan. And he did and had been seeing a cardiologist for several years, but just test, nothing was found. But he went and had this specific CT scan because of what Pat just went through. Mm -hmm. And his brother called (laughs) that night to say, uh, actually a week ago, to say, just so you know, I have an aortic aneurysm at the base of my heart, exactly where yours blew out. He said, and I also have a dissection, which is a tear, two veins off of the aorta. He said, you basically just saved my life. So God is just continuing yeah. thank you for that. <laughs> the Lord's overwhelmed us. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it, wow. it's, it's so hard to take in. As I tell people, it's, it's really 
hard to talk about miracles and our finite words with an infinite God. Yeah. And and so, but we're witnessing it. So more tests are going to happen. They're trying to figure out his surgery. So we've told his other brother, you need to now go get checked. And then in addition, we just saw a genetic cardiologist a week ago. So um, we have now learned a whole other world of genetics. And so we are finding out that recently, within the past, I don't know, eight to ten years, they have found out there's people with issues that show no symptoms. And so that describes Pat, his brother, and his father, no symptoms, but they're carrying a genetic, a gene that is major aortic issues, but there's no signs. Wow. So thank goodness that research has come about, and so we're, we're waiting for that. DNA will be about three to four weeks. So, yeah, thank you for that. Praise so God. just, Praise yeah. Come here, Tom. Praise God. You know, what looks like what looks like your tragedy could be somebody else's triumph, right? Because we serve a God of miracles, amen? We serve, Pastor, thank you for the privilege to preach and teach tonight, and we missed you. Welcome home. I'm sure when you pulled into Lake Wiley, Clover area, you probably said there's no place like home, right? That's what we talked about last Wednesday night. There's no place like home. Say it with me. There's no place like home. And when you hear that, what do you think of? Some of you think of heaven. Some of you think of the Wizard of Oz, right, Dorothy? Click those shoes, right? <laughs> I don't know about you, but even when I was a little boy, a little kid watching that on TV, maybe the first time in black and white, I'm, I'm sure, but those little monkeys scared me. And anybody else was like, the demonic-looking little imps, man. I didn't like those things at all. But, you know, when I, I think about that, and you can go ahead and turn to Psalm 91 and get ready. Somebody say, get ready. Yes. Uh, this is what a powerful passage. In fact, I have a little marble placard on my desk, a little paperweight that says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. And, but when I think about no place like home, I, I think about how much God has blessed us to travel and be on mission trips and have various experiences in our life because I know some people never get outside of their city or their county I remember a pastor friend sharing years ago about a man they took out of his city in his county in Georgia he had never been away from there and he went to Mexico on a mission trip so help me this is what this man said he saw these little kids speaking in Spanish and he went to the pastor leader and he said pastor those kids are smart have you heard them speak in Spanish? You know, they're smart. And he just didn't realize that outside of his place in Georgia, people spoke other languages, right? So anyway, welcome to our world. So, <laughs> so with the first mission trip, some of these stories you, you've heard, but the first mission trip we went on to Haiti and to Puerto Rico, I remember I had a long blonde hair, curly hair at the time. Deb, it kind of looked like yours, you know, and I got off that airplane in Puerto Rico, and they said, hey, gringo, you're not from here, are you? So, I mean, that was, that was my first welcome to Puerto Rico. And when we got to Haiti, uh, we got on a little boat going to an island, and I literally thought our first mission trip were going to heaven. I thought we were going to die in the sea. I really, really did. So, just story after story. I think about our first cruise. Anybody ever been on a cruise? And you see Miss Audrey, I think she's going to have a meeting about an upcoming cruise that you could possibly go on. And our first one, we went as chaperones for the high school. What were we thinking, right? <laughs> There's a pleasure cruise for you, right? <laughs> so I remember talking to a lady that had been on a cruise. She'd been on like, I think, 21 cruises. And I'm thinking, she said, oh, it's the way to vacation. You're going to love it. You're going to enjoy it. And I kid you not, we're, I think, our first night on the cruise, I remember walking down the halls and hitting the walls. I mean, that boat, that ship was rocking. And I'm, I'm thinking, man, I'm glad I wore the bracelet and I took the Dramamine or whatever I took because it was, it was rough. In fact, I heard that lady who's been on 21 cruises say, this is the worst one I've ever been on. But fortunately, we got over that hump, we've been on more, and it is the way to vacation. It's, it's an awesome, awesome experience. Well, we've been in Man, the Dominican Republic and Honduras and Costa Rica. I remember being in Costa Rica, I think it was, or might have been in Honduras and getting on a zip line, going down, thinking, oh, Lord, I hope this thing will hold up this big boy because I, you know, I, but I'm ready to go to heaven, but I didn't want to be on a zip line getting there. But anyway, 
just experience after experience, you know, being in Belize, seeing those tarantulas, you know, ladies screaming because they see them in their huts. Danica can attest to that. And being in a hut, I never have understood how you can be in a hut like Gilligan's Island, I kid you not, and looking through the roof and seeing stars and seeing star flies or uh, what do you call them, lightning bugs, right? And it would pour down raining and it wouldn't leak. And we come back to America and we're supposed to have seamless, leakless roofs. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with this picture, right? <laughs> and just, you know, being in uh, one of the places, I think it was Dominican, and it was like 125 degrees, and this boy does not like hot weather. Man, I'm telling you, I said, Lord, why don't you call me on a mission trip to Alaska or something, or Siberia, Russia. I mean, I'm always going to these hot places, and we're out and we're digging a trench and sweating like crazy. But I remember coming home on a lot of those mission trips and getting off the plane. As much as I love to go, as, love, as much as I love to see souls saved and God's spirit moving and God doing amazing things, I almost wanted to kiss the ground. Sometimes I did. I'd get off that plane and I'd say, thank you, Jesus, for the United States of America. And to go into your house and say, man, there's just no place like home. Have you ever been in places and then you would get home and especially in those third world countries and you'd stand under a shower just weeping? Just saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I can turn on a switch. Because Pastor knows we've been to Guyana before and you'd have to, you know, rainwater that they collect on top of the roofs and you'd get it filled into a little bucket and you'd try to pour out what you could uh, to, get, to get, you know, baths and showers and you know, it's it just an amazing thing. And, and y'all heard this story, but I remember being in Guyana my first time with a group of pastors and uh, dropped off to, to preach. And so they're taking pastors to other places to preach. And I'm going to be the last one they pick up that night. Young pastor, I'm scared to death. I don't know anybody. And after I'm through preaching, and it is pitch dark. And I told the senior native pastor there, I said, Pastor, you have a bathroom? He said, oh, yeah, brother, yeah, follow me. Come on. So we walked through a pig pen. Okay, good sign right there. And walked over to an outhouse that I could barely see, but when you open the door, everything imaginable was like swirling around, flying around. And it stank bad, and I'm telling you, bad. And I said, Lord, <laughs> you said whatever I bind on earth will be bound in heaven. I am not going to the bathroom in here. And I remember going out, standing by that road, and waiting on the taxi to come with the rest of those pastors. So I can't dying to get to that nice four-star hotel we're staying in and I'm kidding you so we get to this hotel I run up to my room get ready to go to the bathroom and in my toilet was a rat yeah I want to tell you there's no place like home <laughs> right? so when you're sitting down tonight you're taking your shower tonight and say somebody just thank you Jesus there's no place like home right turn to Psalm 91 if you were not here last week and you would like to see that sheet and kind of as we go through our review, uh, they are to my left, to Cynthia's right by the media sound booth on that stage, on that platform. If you want last week's sheet, you're welcome to grab that as we review it very quickly. And then we're going to pick up uh, at around verse 7. But if you want to turn in your Bibles again to Psalm 91 out of the New King James Version, we're not going to read the entire chapter tonight since we did that last week but if you're able would you stand as we honor the word of God Psalm 91 I'll read verse 1 then we'll go to verse 7 would you read one with me one with me he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty and starting again in verse 7 a thousand may fall at your side 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. You don't, you don't have to read with me. You can, but I'm going to fly. So, okay, I'm not going to do the responsive reading. So, <laughs> All right. Only with your eyes shall you look, and you'll see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me. 
Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. And he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life and I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Thank you, Father, that there's a group of people here tonight. You've shown us your salvation. And God, what a privilege to breathe in the Spirit of God that you have filled our lungs, not only with breath in this life, but breath forever and forever and forever because of what you've done. Because Jesus Christ is our dwelling place. And we thank you for it. And if anybody's saved, give him praise in this house tonight. Come on. God bless you. God bless you. God, thank you. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 91, just uh, recapping very quickly what we talked about last week. Remember, Psalm 90 and verse 91 were probably written by Moses, the oldest psalms written. They were uh, like a concert. It was not only uh, liturgical, but it was lyrical and it was poetic. And you get uh, a responsive recitation to a person speaking and a person spoken to and a person spoken of says he who dwells that word means to to sit to rest to abide to occupy to the point where you throw the squatters out somebody say shut the door and keep out the devil right it's what we talked about sunday and so it's not just abiding with christ but it's resisting the enemy so we want to stay in the secret place again if you honor the secret place He'll honor you in the public place. We talked about that. And then we talked about in these first two verses, you see four names of God that are mentioned. Uh, Elyon, El Shaddai, Jehovah, Elohim. We're not going to take time to go in those. We did that last week. So if you weren't here last week, see somebody that was here last week and they'll give you the answers, right? And in verse 2, it says, I will say he is my refuge, he is my fortress. Again, the devil cannot read your mind. But he hears your words. And not just negativity, not just thinking, thinking. But when you say, God, you're my refuge. And God, I don't know how I'm going to make it. But God, you are going to get me through. The devil hears that. And he knows that you're reacting and you're responding. And you're declaring those words by faith. Amen. Come on, help me out. Amen. <laughs> and in verse 3, it says, he shall deliver you. We talked about last week at least four times in this passage, whatever virgin you might have. It says he will deliver you. You can be saved, but sometimes you need to be saved from stuff. Christians need to be delivered from things. And we talked about a plethora of things last week. We might talk about that a little bit more tonight. And then in verse 4, it says he shall cover you. The truth shall be your shield and your buckler. That that truth, that belt of truth, that buckler of truth holds everything together on the armor. We talked about that last week so if you weren't here again you feel free to pull that back up online and kind of get some more meat to that here's some interesting things in verse five a terror by night that's the secret enemy that's the stuff that you battle with you probably came to church and you were battling with something in your mind he's like man i should not be thinking that way am i the only one no. come on <laughs> you know and, and and there are times right before you ready to teach or preach come on teachers and a thought will come to you and you're like, man, that's from the pit. And you've got to rebuke the enemy, right? And so, that, so those secret enemies, now there's stuff that's public that everybody sees. Everybody knows you're struggling with it. It's in your face. And we'll talk more about that. And in verse 5, we see that uh, there's a terror by night. So don't forget in the night what you learned in the light. And in those arrows that fly by day, those are those up, uh, open enemies, public enemies. And then we talked about pestilence that walks in the darkness. A lot of commentators say this is talking about secret sicknesses and illnesses. Anybody ever deal with stuff like, oh, man, I'm feeling this. I wonder if it could be that. I, I've got this uh, congestion going on right. I wonder if it's this. Or, I, man, I've got this going on. I wonder if that could be what my daddy had or my granddaddy had. Now, again, there's some viability in looking at what some of those are, like we've heard about tonight. But also the enemy can also play tricks on you and try to torment you about those secret things. Because I, I hear people say all the time, I've never told anybody this, but I've been struggling with this sickness, this illness, this ailment, and nobody's ever known. Even their own mates don't know sometimes, right? And then there's public sicknesses. Uh, and then in verse 7, 
it shall not come near you. Uh, a thousand at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. Uh, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, Tina woke, we woke up and she said, man, what in the world were you dreaming last night? And I said, I was playing basketball. You know that's a dream, right? <laughs> some of our older guys, they met Tuesday night and played some pickup basketball here. And uh, I thought if somebody asked me, to, in fact, somebody did. They asked me, sir, are you going to show up and play? I said, that is a young man's game. I am not playing, but i got to work the next day, you know. <laughs> I've got insurance, but I don't want to test it. Anyway, <laughs> so all these guys survived. There were no injuries, but, I, but in my dreams, I was playing basketball. And Tina said, I think I actually, did I hit you, baby? I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> kind of hit my wife. So if you see any bruises, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. So then, then the next night, I think it was the very next night, uh, she woke me up and said, what are you doing now? Are you playing basketball again? <laughs> and I, like, you know, just fidgeting and hitting her and hitting the baseboard. And I said, tonight it was a gunfight. I mean, I walked into this building. There's multiple floors, and there's people shooting, and I'm shooting at them, and I, knife fights, gun fights. Here's the interesting part. I had that dream two nights in a row, and I never got wounded. I never got hurt. I never got killed, but I was taking out people, thousands upon ten thousands. And when I read this, I was like, whoa, whoa. There's going to be stuff that you go through that you don't think you're going to make it. You're not going to survive. You're not going to live through this. But by the grace of God, there's going to be a supernatural covering and a blanket and a canopy over you to get you through. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, he's going to get you through. Come on. So we're picking this verse up. And Lord willing, by God's grace, we'll finish tonight. And uh, you think about that statement. We talked about this. This is what we closed with last Wednesday night, but it shall not come near you. I said, what do you think about this statement? If you're really dwelling in Christ, nothing can really harm you. We talked about Romans 8, that all things work together for good that love God. We talked about Job, that even though he was attacked physically, financially, relationally, that spiritually Satan could not touch him. So you're going to go through stuff. Anybody been through some stuff? But your soul is kept by God Almighty. Amen? And so in verse 8, it talks about the reward of the wicked. So what are some of the rewards? And that's kind of a tricky word for us. But what are some of the rewards of the righteous and some of the rewards of the wicked? Why don't we do side to side, all right? So on this side, let me get a couple of responses. Are what are some of the rewards, benefits? of being a believer, of being righteous, of following after God. Let me hear a few of those, and then a couple of, of quote-unquote rewards for the wicked. Somebody just raise your hand up. What? Peace for the righteous. What else? Everlasting Heaven. Everlasting life. That all? Come on, saints. Good health. Good health. Joy. Joy unspeakable, right? Yeah. All right. Now, what about this side? Rewards or the wages, if you will, of, of the wicked because the Bible says what in Romans 6 23 for the wages of sin is death all right but so what are those rewards of the wicked they think oh, this is good this is paying off money fame yes materialism material things right yeah and you are thinking of rewards but it's also this is the wages huh depression yeah, discouragement, loneliness, emptiness. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, y'all y'all pointed out some good things. And even David would look from time to time at the wicked and say, God, why are they prospering? Why are they doing good? Why do they have all the good stuff? And then he would flip it and he would see the kingdom reality. But we know what God says and where everything's going to end up. Sin, again, will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you want to stay. Can I get a testimony? Anybody can identify with that? And in verse 9 it says, Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. Notice those two words, because and made. Because and made. In other words, it's cause and effect. It's conditional. It's intentional. You're just not going to haphazardly go, Whoa, I just fell into this place. I fell into this house. I just so happen to be living here. You're going to have to make a decision to get into that secret place, to dwell with God, to spend time with God. How many of you know life is crazier and more busy and more stressful than ever before? And you've got to make time for your maker. 
<laughs> Amen? You got to do it. So we notice that we want promises without the principles. We want the rewards without the work. We want the blessings without the obedience. But the Bible says, like in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, if my people who are called by name will what? Humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will what? Heal their land. But it starts out with if. It's conditional. What about 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's conditional. There's so many conditions in the word of God. In verse 10, it says, no evil, nor any plague. So how do you interpret this promise of protection when bad things happen to good people? We addressed that some last week, but just anybody want to add to that? How do you interpret this, this promise of protection when bad things happen to good people? I, I know of a, a young man and loved his grandfather, spent great time with his grandfather, loved him. Uh, as far as I know, was in church. This grandfather had a relationship with God, but as he got older, he started struggling with dementia, and it got to the point where the family had to make sure that there were no guns around his house, and this uh, grandson was working with his grandmother out in the farm, out in the yard, and all of a sudden, they didn't see the granddad for a while, and they thought, why is he not coming down? What, what's wrong? And so he went up to the house, and all the doors were locked, and eventually he basically climbed up a trellis he went to a bedroom window and as he uh, opened that bedroom door in the window his grandfather turned around with a rifle and he said I love you son and he took his life right in front of his, his grandson what do you do with stuff like that when you know that was a man that was in church that had a relationship with God but then he struggled with dementia and you've all experienced things with your family and with other people that you've counseled and you ministered to and when bad things happen to good people how do you justify that what do you say about those verses no evil shall befall you no plague shall come against you anybody just have a thought on that that's tough stuff john uh, right there wait a minute get the mic thank you you know we we live in a fallen world and there is cause and effect on both sides. There's cause and effect if we humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways. There's also cause and effect for people that don't do that. And we have to be okay with what happens. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying that, that you, know, you live your life just by saying whatever, but you do have to be okay. You know, I know that my salvation is in Jesus Christ and nothing because he said, nothing can take me out of his hand. Yeah. And so no matter what happens here on this earth, what happens to me or anybody that I love, nothing's going to change that. Mm -hmm. And I have to be good with that. Yeah. And I want to be good with that. Amen. Amen. I remember, again, what Pastor said at, at Lonnie's homegoing service here. He said, um, you know, folks, you just got to get to the place where you understand that God knows things we don't know. <laughs> You know, look at your neighbor and say, uh, I'm not God, and you're not God. Come on. He's God. And he knows things we don't know. He knows how people are going to react and how they're going to respond. There, how many of you have experienced someone dying, and you just did not know, you did not understand, but there were people that came to Christ because of that person's life, because of that testimony, because of that tragedy, because of that situation. And see, God sees... From an eternal perspective, we don't. Anybody else, just a quick thought on this question right here. I know it's deep right there. Laura? So, about, April was about three years ago that I, um, and I'm going to be raw for a second here, was at the point of suicide. Um, things had happened in my life, things had, that just felt unbearable and I remember feeling overwhelmed by that feeling and feeling like I had no hope now remember at this point I was an ordained minister we're not separate
from the hurts and the trials because we are a Christian. We still live in a world, like he said, a fallen world. We still live in a place where heartache and hurt happens. Yep. We still live in a place where we have to walk a walk that exemplifies Christ, and it doesn't always. Thankfully, what I would say is that even though the bad things are going to happen and those moments happen, if we turn to him, he can restore us and restore the moment and redeem it. And I say that because it took me about a year to get to that place to where I was in a place of health again. And I still look back and I still have to walk those paths at times. But I am so grateful because the Lord has used that story, that testimony, the fact that I was at the brink of saying, I can't, Mm -hmm. to leave my family. Even though I knew that wasn't the answer. But I say that because, again, God restores and redeems Mm -hmm. and moves, and he's taken that moment. So I would love to say that bad things won't happen to us when we become Christians. He's not an easy button like the Staple One commercial that you remember. He's not, but he's always very present. His voice in our head are his kind words. He sends people in our paths. So again, he restores, he redeems, and he uses those testimonies. Amen. Amen. God is my refuge, my strength, a very present help, help in times of trouble. Thank you for being real and being raw, and thank the Lord for the times that he's turned us around. And he took us out of that darkness into his marvelous light. And, you know, you look at the next promise in verse 11. It says, and he will give his angels charge over you. And if you look at Psalm 34, verse 7, it says, those that fear the Lord, he will put his angels uh, out there to deliver you. So, again, it's one of those contingencies. It's one of those prerequisites. I've got to fear God. And the promise is he's going to have angels that guard me. Is there anybody that's got a real quick testimony about angelic protection in your life? You know that you know that God spared you, or maybe you even saw the angel. You experienced it. Anybody have a quick testimony there? John, can hang on. When I was 19, I worked as a roofer and uh, working on a warehouse in Charlotte. And part of the warehouse gave way. And that happened to be the part of the roof that I was on. And I fell 20 feet, 20 plus feet, onto gravel. But the gravel wasn't right underneath where I was. What was underneath where I was was rebar sticking out of the ground. And so the guy that saw me fall said he saw me fall at an angle. And I have no doubt that it was that it was God that caused that that sent angels down to direct my fall. Right there. You know, and and I was not supposed to walk afterwards. I had injured my back to the point where they didn't think I'd ever walk again. And God said, I clearly heard him say that night, You are not going to be a paralytic. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't. Mm-hmm. And I'm not. Right there. And I right. give him all the praise for that. You know, guys that are as tall and tall as big as John are, they only fall straight. They don't fall on an angle. We know that. (laughs) That was a God thing. That was a God thing, right? And in verse 12, he says, In their hands they shall bear you up. Now, who quoted that? Later, in the New Testament, in some life experiences, who quoted that? Satan. Satan. In Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was being tempted, what? In the wilderness. And remember when Satan said, Hey, Just throw yourself off this pinnacle. Throw yourself off this mountain. And the angels of the Lord will come and they won't even let you dash your foot against the stone. He was quoting what Moses had said in these Psalms. So uh, any thoughts on how Satan, yes, he took a verse. He took a passage, but he twisted it. And what was Jesus' response? It is written, what? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So anybody just want to, Take a, take a thought about how Satan, why you think Satan was twisting this verse and using this verse? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. yeah. what he did. Did God really say this? Yeah. Yeah, he said to Eve, did God really say this? So 
In other words, God has given you a path and a kingdom destiny and a purpose. And we know what Jesus' was, right? And Satan was trying, even though he was using scripture, he was using truth, but he was trying to get Jesus off of God's path, off of God's will, off of God's purpose for his life. We've got to receive the whole counsel. Somebody say whole counsel. The whole counsel of God. Verse 13 talks about the lion. It said you're going to overcome the lion. You're going to overcome. You're going to step upon the cobra and the serpent. A lot of theologians and people that study say that the lion represents what is before you. You see it coming. Now you see pictures of lions that are crouching down. They're behind some uh, brush and they're trying to get more prey. But they're not afraid of that prey. They're not afraid of you. Hello? In fact, in Proverbs 30, 30 says, look at all these things that are stately in their stride and they bow before nothing. And the first thing mentioned is the lion. He is the king of beasts. He's not afraid. So these are enemies that come at you and it's in your face. It's right there. You see it. You can't deny it. And, and, and it's, no, it's no secret. Okay? But the cobra and the servant is behind you. It's slithering. It's sneaking. And you go, what hit me? What did I do? I can't believe that happened. Most of us can identify with those things. And in verse 14, I love this. Listen, because he has set his love upon me. God is speaking and he's, take, he's talking to you. He's talking to me because you have set your love upon me. Here's what he's going to do. Look at these real quick. I will deliver him. I will set him on high. I will answer him. I will deliver him and honor him. I will satisfy him. I love that. I will set him on high. Listen, devotion brings promotion. Devotion brings promotion. Intimacy brings authority and security and identity in your life. If we're not intimate with God, we're going to begin to question who we are. If we're not intimate with God, we're going to be, begin to question what we're here for. Right? It gives us authority. It gives us security. It gives us identity. That's why the great commandment is to know the Lord God. The great commission is to make him known. In verse 15, it says, I will answer him. We talked about this Sunday night. We, we dove into that simple promise, that simple God's phone number in Jeremiah 33.3. 3. Say it with me. Call unto me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things which you know not. So again, God is saying, hey, if you practice my presence, you're going to see answers in prayer. Let me say that again. People that practice his presence see answers in prayer. You have not because you ask not. You don't ask. There's stuff that God is holding in his warehouse, his treasury, and he's got it for you. And he's like, why don't you ask? I've got this. Right? You know the acrostic A-S-K, asking ye shall receive seeking you will knock and the door will be open right and some of you might be thinking well I just I just don't really quite know how to pray I don't know what kind of principles to follow use that simple acrostic A C T S right A is for adoration C is for confession T is for thanksgiving S is for supplication God supply my need give to my need these are simple things that we can do but we just got to do it. Praise God. What a wonderful time of prayer Sunday night. Come out every Sunday night if you can and just enjoy the Lord's presence in prayer. But you got to be doing it every day. And look in verse 15. It says, I will be with him in trouble. How many of you have been in trouble before? You're in church. Don't lie. Every hand ought to be up. All right. I will be with him in trouble, in it and through it. God doesn't always get you out of it. And spare you from it, but he's going to be with you in it. That's why I love Isaiah 43, too, that uh, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and neither shall the flame kindle upon you. I read this the other day. Man, what a statement. I don't know if it's in your notes or not. People that experience his peace give up their right to understand. Let me say that a couple of times. People that experience his peace give up their right to understand. <laughs> People that experience his peace give up their right to understand. Again, you put your place in the hands 
of an almighty God, a sovereign God, a loving God, a good God, a good father. And you say, God, I don't always understand, again, your hand, but I trust your heart that you've got this and you've got me. And then it says, I will deliver him and I will honor him. If you honor him, he'll honor you. If you're humble, if you humble yourself before him, he will honor you. Anybody here tonight, he's taken your test and made it a testimony. He's taken your mess and he made it a message. He's taken your shame and turned it into glory for his name. Come on, can I get a witness? I'm going to ask Alec and the praise team to please come back. And in verse 16, it says, I will satisfy him with long life. There's some scriptures there you need to read about the kind of life he wants to give you to satisfy you with. Uh, again, it's probably believed that, that Moses wrote, wrote Psalm 90, and there's some neat verses in there about making the most of every opportunity and uh, don't take any day or any year or any season of your life for granted. Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do this. Psalm 138, 8 says, you know, that the Lord... Uh, will fulfill his purposes concerning you and he will fulfill the works of his hands. John 10.10 10 says he gives you life to the full. I hope there's some people here tonight saying, Lord, I just want to dwell in you. I want to love you. I want to know you. I want to call on you. I want to trust in you. And would you, as you stand with me, let's go ahead and stand and just ask yourself in just the craziness, the busyness of life, where have you been living? Where have you been living? Where have you been? I mentioned this uh, in a marriage class. I think I alluded to it in the sermon Sunday or Sunday night. I can't remember exactly. You know, the Bible says man plans his ways, but God orders his steps. And sometimes he'll order your stops. He'll order your stop. You know, headed on the, ho on, uh, on the way to the hospital to see my mom and, you know, watched a bunch of nice bikers to the left of me and then boom, boom, boom. There was several cars hit their brakes, skid it, hit each other and I was the caboose. You know? And But you know what? one of the first things I thought of after I called my wife <laughs> was for the first time in maybe decades I didn't get up that morning and read the word. Now granted, we were babysitting a granddaughter and she gets up at oh dark 30 you know, so I knew later tonight I'll read the word when I get home. But one of the first things that came to my mind was seek ye first, first, the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. Now, I don't think God, every time we don't pray or don't read the word or we don't do something, God's just going to pound us. But there's just something beautiful and blessed about giving him your best, giving him the first and being intimate with him and dwelling in that secret place. I just want to encourage you tonight. If you need this altar, we're here to pray for you. If you just want to say, hey, pastor, I just want to be real. I haven't been in the secret place like I should be. I haven't been in the word. I haven't been in prayer. I haven't been devoted to him. So I'm asking you tonight, where are you living? Where are you dwelling? If I dwell, he will. If I dwell, he will. He will honor me. He will bless me. He will help me. He will protect me. Father, as we worship you just in these few moments, God, if anybody needs this altar to say, Lord, help me to get back to that secret place. Help me to get back to that dwelling place. I realize it, it's not just my home. It's not just that place where I feel comfortable, but it's the presence of Jesus. You are my dwelling place. And so, Lord, I run to that place tonight.
Jesus Christ, my living hope. You could imagine so great a mercy, but hark a fathom such boundless grace. I shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If you're here tonight with every eye closed, but if you just would raise your hand to say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to come under his shelter. I need his shadow. I need his covering. I, it, it's just been crazy. I've been stressed. I've been anxious. But I need the Lord's canopy to cover me tonight. If you just raise your hand. Father, all over this place, all over this house, God, you see the hand, you see the heart, you see the struggle, you see the stuff that we go through. And I pray the shadow of the Almighty cover them tonight because we're living in you, we're dwelling in you, we're resting in you, we're trusting in you. So give that hope, give that peace, give that victory, give that anointing, God, give that peace that passes all understanding. 
because our trust is in a living God and a living hope, Jesus Christ. We dwell in you. As we go from this place, we go in your presence and in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.